Welcome to today's webinar. I am Skylar with Lean Frontiers. You can also see Jamie Flinchball on your screen. Um, today, we are going to tap into Jamie's brain about the lessons that have been learned since writing his book, People Solve Problems. So with that, it is right at two o'clock. So Jamie, tell us about yourself and why you wrote this book. Sure. Well, you know, probably a lot of the people from the Lean Frontiers community will, will know me from uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to Lean that I wrote a long time ago and and the, the consulting work I did uh, uh, co-founded with Andy Carlino. And, and since exiting that business, I've been doing other things, mostly advisory work today. But today I mostly work one-on-one uh, -on -one with executives as, a, as an advisor, uh, a little bit of coach, a little bit of thought partner uh, as, as they go. And so you know, I, I wrote this book. Um, I, I knew I wanted to to write another book, and and finally got around to this one. Um, and I've been I've been on a campaign where first I think problem solving was a much bigger part of of lean than it had gotten credit for in the first couple of decades of us all talking about lean. Uh, so I was always trying to elevate it, but in the pursuit of elevating it, sort of you know unwound it explored it, uh, et cetera. And so um, there's really two reasons I'd say I, I wrote, wrote this book. One reason I write anything is it it helps helps me clarify my thinking. Um, I, I think writing does that for anybody, but that's why I, I do it purposely. Let me really clarify my thinking and explore the topic in depth. So it was a, a selfish act of, of <laughs> helping me uh, learn and, and and think. Um, but also, you know, as, as I, I looked out there in the world and I just saw so many good problem solvers and bad problem solvers. And, and I, I saw that the tools were irrelevant, not that they don't matter, but, you know, the people doing great work were using the same tools as the people doing poor work. And the people doing great work were using different tools as each other. And I, I, I've, I know I've been on a campaign that Problem solving training shouldn't begin and end with a tool, but I just thought let's let's explore explode that topic and and really build on it. So, so that it it began as a as a doorway, and then you know partway through, I my extra committed to this, I, I took out almost almost any reference to a tool. Like there's plenty out there on the tools, lots of really good books and content, lessons and training. So I'm gonna really talk about the stuff that I think is not talked about enough. And that's what I tried to make the whole book about. Okay. So since writing People Solve Problems, you've had many conversations with people about it. And you've also started having even more conversations in your podcast that has the same name. What have you learned or what surprised you since writing the book? Yeah. So, so, you know, uh, changing my lens, right? So, you know, since since writing the book, I clarify my thinking. I kind of look and interpret data and observations a little differently. Talk with many clients about it. Have conversations like this about it, and then the podcast has been, you know, really fun because it's talked to old friends like Steve Spear and Derwood Sobeck, and uh, you know, met with some new people as well. And so it's been all fantastic. But I think. I think my two biggest lessons since writing it, um, and, and I, I think I had these thoughts, but really hadn't explored them nearly far enough. One is how much people are doing problem solving without realizing it, just in everyday meetings, right? Just, yeah, you know, everybody listening can think about their next meeting or think about their last meeting and just pay attention to what parts of that conversation, you hardly get through any meeting without some problem solving going on. And we didn't pull out a tool, right? We didn't pull out a template, but some problem solving went on. And the, the, the danger of that, it's not that we shouldn't do that. We're doing that anyway. That's happening. That's just going to happen all the time. The danger of not being aware of that is that we don't enable the kinds of skills, capabilities, mindsets that we do turn on like a switch when we pull out the template and do the problem solving. So that those everyday moment by moment behaviors, you know, a lot of times we're talking about sort of switching from 
uh, as Daniel Kahneman says, system one, where we're just on automatic, into system two, where we're really thinking and processing. And that's what we should be doing in those meetings. That moment where we're talking about a problem and trying to frame it, we should move into system two and think carefully about it. And if we're not aware that what we're really doing is problem solving, it becomes that much harder to do it. And so I, I think, um, I, I think you know, people and and I, even myself probably I, we we weren't as aware as much as much as we should be about how much problem solving happens in day to day moments and how to get the most out of that. So, so that I think is is important for everyone, but also important for me from an articulation standpoint. And the second is. Well, while I hope to make this clear in the book, but I don't think I went really far enough, is that, and I think I have a different way to say it now, but there's a lot of methods and tools that aren't problem solving, but I'll kind of call problem solving adjacent, right? And I'll just use like strategic planning as an example. Most strategic planning is problem solving. We don't think of it as such because it has a name, right? And it has a process and you know, make it up however you want. But what are you really doing? You're doing problem solving. So, so uh, you know, org design as an example. People are like, oh, I want to change my org design. And like, okay, well, let's go and do org design. But org design is simply problem solving, right? And so, I, I think helping, uh, you know, really seeing all how how do we better connect problem solving capabilities to all these other problem solving adjacent tools that have a specific purpose, but in the end. Um, are really problem solving. And I think the danger of, of of falling short on that is that we we miss the opportunity to leverage all we do know about problem solving in those moments. And I'll I'll make a quick uh, give org design as a quick example. I can't tell you how many org designs happen because somebody just felt something was wrong, but they never redefine the problem that they're trying to solve, and whether uh, org org design was the right way to solve that versus a process design. And that, that happens all the time. And so I think we're, we were more aware that org design is problem solving and strategic planning is problem solving. We can better integrate that, that thinking and those, those capabilities. So if you were to have a second edition on for this, what would you do differently? So, yeah, and who knows if we'll have, you know, I, more likely than a second edition will be an, another book. And who, <laughs> knows, who knows what that's about? I, I hate retreading old ground, but, but I, you know, the original draft, or not the original draft, the original outline of the book was probably twice as long as it, as it turned out to be. Um, I had post-its on, on my wall of windows and, and uh, you know, rather than what was essentially for four or five sections of the book, it, it would have been about eight or nine. And so I started doing sort of a page count. I'm like, I don't think people want to read a 500 pa uh, page book. Um, so so I, 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 I trimmed aggressively on, on what I wanted to include. But I, I do think, um, yeah, I do think for starters, I would, I would probably open up a whole section on the book around, you know, complex, uh, broad, open-ended problem solving. Um, again, tool I'd stay tool agnostic. I think that was advice I got in the editing of the book, and I, I, I'm, I'm glad I took that advice. It wasn't my idea, but I'm really glad it was tool agnostic because I, I really want it to be helpful regardless of what tools people that choose to use. But whether it's strategic planning or org design or things like that, just having these, these complex sort of often amorphous problems that we solve, you know, we kind of launch into these things. They're all around us. They're hard and, and just uh, somewhat trying to demystify them. But again, as I kind of said earlier, better integrate problem solving into these, these messy, complex events. Um, you know, I, I definitely had planned for a whole section of the book on that. Uh, kind of felt like at this point, if I would have done that, um, I don't know if it would have appealed to more people, but I think it would have been more useful to help people expand their 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 palette, if you will, of right. problem solving. There's there's definitely still some people when they, you know, they they pick up the book. It's before they even open it. They pick up the book. In their mind is an A3 template or something, 
And, and so then they read the whole book, no matter how many words I say about it not being about the A3, <laughs> they're still interpreting the whole book through that problem solving tool. And uh, I, I think writing a section on, 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 on that would have been, would have been really useful. Um, so I think that would have been probably the most useful uh, thing to change. And while I do write about coaching a lot, I think maybe maybe a whole section around how to self-improve, right? Because we don't always have access to a coach. So um, that that feels to me a little bit more like a, a you know, how to self-hack, which is usually how we often refer to some self-improvement. But uh, <laughs> but it would have been useful for me to think through more more deeply anyway. You know, I certainly have opinions and ideas, but that even if it's just for the idea of how to of thinking through the topic, uh, really working on how can somebody self-improve without the benefit of a coach, uh, maybe would have been a useful section of the book. Um, even though I still believe, you know, there's a whole section of the book on coaching. I still believe that's the best way to improve. Well, it sounds like you probably could come up with a second edition. So <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I know I could. It's just whether I whether I choose to. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, what after writing this, what have you found to be the best ways to get better at problem solving? So I, I think one of the things about breaking it down into capabilities, right? I, I, I don't even remember if I wrote this in the book, but I like to say problem solving isn't a capability. It's a collection of many capabilities. I hope I wrote that in the book, but uh, anyway, I believe that. So, um, so I think the first key is to only pick one capability at a time. Don't try to get better at problem solving. Try to get better at cause and effect. Try to get better at problem statements. Um, you know, even get try to get better at integrating intuition. Uh, you know, is is not a it's not a step in problem solving, right? But it's a it's a capability around how we do that. So I, I think that's the first thing is is get um, you know pick an pick a dimension, pick an area of problem solving to improve. Don't try to bite off the whole thing. Um, I think second is get really deliberate in your practice, right? Almost to the point of, you know, if you're teaching somebody, I, I don't know how to teach somebody baseball, but if you're teaching somebody baseball or golf, it's like, well, show me a slow swing, right? Uh, break it down, go very slowly, be very deliberate. You're not going to hit a ball that way, but you can kind of see what you're supposed to go through. And so I think slowing it down, being more aware, being very deliberate, and then as we almost always self-improve reflection, right? Um, so pick an area, I, uh, you know, focus very deliberate practice and then do whether it's, you don't have to reflect every time, but do enough reflection. So you're really thinking about that practice and getting the most out of it. And you don't have to reach perfection in that capability, but you can make some progress and on one dimension and then pick another and get, get better at that. Um, so, you know, for example, uh, I'll use myself because I'm always trying to improve. You know, I can write about it. It doesn't mean I'm automatically good at it. Um, I'm trying to get better right now at integrating intuition. Um, and, and one of the mechanisms I like to use for that um, is, is, is going for a swim, um, going for a hike. And uh, since I, I recently cleared off 13 inches of snow off our driveway, uh, both of those things haven't happened, right? <laughs> so... <laughs> My favorite tools uh, for tapping into my intuition around hard problems hasn't hasn't been as accessible to me. So I'm like, all right, I need to expand my palette. And this wasn't a this week kind of thought, just a, a broad effort. And so I, you know, my my effort is to to find other ways to practice integrating intuition, expand my palette of of mechanisms to do that, and um, practice and reflect. And so that, that's that's one thing that I'm working on right now. Okay, so um, when are people actually doing problem solving but may not realize it? And you've kind of touched on it a little bit too. Yeah, I, I, I have. I think um, the easiest way uh, to recognize it is when we don't know the answer, <laughs> um, right? So I, I think we can separate a little bit uh, and, and where people draw the line of problem solving, I, I, I kind of don't care. But troubleshooting versus problem solving or is problem solving, uh, you know, include troubleshooting. 
But a lot of troubleshooting is what we call solution matching, right? I already know the answer. I just have to like, you know, pick the right one off the shelf and match it to the problem, right? So I, I, I probably overuse this example, but my gas gauge says E, I go fill up my car with gas. I don't, it is a problem. I don't need to do problem solving to solve that problem. I just pull the, pull the solution off the shelf and fill the car up with gas. So I think fundamentally the best way to recognize it is when we start realizing that we don't know the answer. Um, now, sometimes we think we know the answer um, and we're wrong. Um, and the, I think the way we recognize that is when everyone seems to have a different opinion, right? So we're trying to make a decision. We're trying to, uh, you know, take a step or resolve something. And it's not like, yeah, yeah, choose A or B, either one's fine. It's like, we have 10 different opinions. Well, right now we're problem solving, right? We have something that has to happen. We have a lot of different opinions that at that level, you're doing some problem solving. Um, so, you know, the hard part about that is, is that it fundamentally requires, uh, you know, being able to say, we don't know. You don't always have to use those words, right? There's, I mean, to me, we can use the words, let's go, let's, let's, let's go do some, uh, deliberate problem solving as code for, we don't know. <laughs> but if we actually said, we don't know when we actually don't know, um, that, that would, that would accelerate people's recognition of those moments. Um, so I, I think when we, when we see, you know, when it's clear, we don't know what needs to happen next, that's a good indication. Um, and, and when a whole bunch of people have different ways to go about resolving a situation, I, I think that feels like problem solving to me as well. Um, the last thing I'd add is the one, the things that we're avoiding, right? Okay. Um, the, you know, so those are the ones we're talking about. The other is the things that we're thinking about when, when no one's around, but we haven't done anything about, right? Um, and, and so whether it's, you know, your personal work or your organizational work or whatever that might be, you're kind of, you know, you talk about in dark corners or think about on your drive home. Yeah, this isn't, this is wrong. This isn't right. But you haven't done anything about it. Um, well, your brain has started problem solving, whether you like it or not. That's part of that integrating intuition. So you might as well acknowledge that you're doing it. And 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 I, I don't just write the problem down on a piece of paper. You can throw the piece of paper away, but it it, it can help your brain trigger with the idea, you know what? I've, I've now recognized this. My brain is engaged with it. It is problem solving. Whether you do an A3 or a eight step or a whatever, I don't, you know, it doesn't matter, but like sort of recognizing those moments that your brain is, your brain is working on the problem. So let's, let's engage all that we have bring that we can bring to the table on that problem solving. I need to focus more on that. Thank you for that. <laughs> um, so in the lean lexicon, where does problem solving fit into that? So, yeah, I, th I think you know we we have thrown around the word lean for a long time, and um, and 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 we assume it. We all know what it means, right? But when it, you know, pull two books off, you know, my own shelf, and you're going to get two different answers to what what it is. Um, it it's it's I, I I really like, of course, not when it's lean frontiers because then it's your title, but but but. But when uh, when it comes down to lean, I love lowercase lean. Like let's try and you know let's stop trying to put it in a box. But to some degree, I believe that lean and problem solving could be synonyms, right? That anytime we're talking about lean, you know, waste elimination is a good example, right? So that that you know old school lean that was almost all lean was about was waste elimination. Um, hopefully, we've evolved past that, that narrow definition, but. You know, waste elimination. Well, what's the target state? Uh, not have waste. What's the observation? I have waste. That's the gap. That's the problem you're trying to solve. It's just because it's waste elimination, we kind of get to skip over some steps because we've defined the, the problem as the waste occurrence of waste. Um, so, so I think that's I think that's part of it. Um, but largely lean today. I don't want to over over categorize it, but we talk about behaviors and culture. We talk about capabilities and people. We talk about skills and tools as well. And, and I think when we when we can put it in all three buckets, 
um, it can be a clear thread across. So, uh, so fundamentally, uh, you know, what are the what are the behaviors? What's the culture around problem solving? What are the capabilities? And then also, what are the tools, right? And understanding they don't all have to exist at the same time, right? So, we see plenty of A3s that have none of the right behaviors surrounding them. So why can't we have some of the right behaviors, even though there's not an A3? So I think if we can kind of, you know, talk about problem solving less with capital letters, just like maybe talk about lean less as a capital letter, but stop talking about problem solving like an event or a tool that's well-defined in a box, but but more of a thread across lean, I think we'll find uh, more more tie-ins to other stuff than, than we're, we're actively talking about, All right? Even... Even coaching, right, itself, I would argue right. coaching coaching is helping other people close a gap, which you could argue is problem solving, right? So do I do an A3? Maybe not. But do I think about gaps and experiments and cause and effect? Absolutely. That's that's part of coaching. Right. Absolutely. Um, what are the actual universal fundamental steps in problem solving? How many different types of problem solving if more than one, are there? <laughs> well, let me start with the latter. Um, the, uh, you know, I don't think there's a universal theory and I hopefully tried successfully to avoid having one. Um, I, I think it's healthy to break it down and build it back up in different ways. The, the number of different tools and methods out there are numerous, many of which have no origins with lean and they all have different strengths and weaknesses. Um, I think, although it's, a, although it's a hard pursuit, if you can pursue mastery in all the different techniques of problem solving, you can help pick out the right tools and methods for the right situation, as opposed to uh, just what's ever most familiar to you. So design thinking doesn't have its origins in lean. Trees doesn't have its origins in lean, but they're still really interesting, useful, tools for, for fuzzier problems where you need to be more creative uh, getting to an outcome, right? So, so I think expanding the palette is, is, is important there, but I've, I've, I don't know if I've ever taken an inventory and listed them all out, so I don't know how many. And as I mentioned before, if you talk about the, the, the problem solving adjacent tools, then the list would be incredibly long. Um, but, you know, the, the, the fundamental steps, I, 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 probably prefer to rephrase that as fundamental capabilities um, because I, I think the steps, I think thinking about them in steps uh, can be dangerous in its own right. And what I mean by that is some of the best problem solving is nonlinear. So you don't, you know, sometimes you start at step three. You shouldn't, but you did. So, you know, <laughs> um, just understand that you started filling out what, what that looks like. Uh, there's a lot of times in sort of very fuzzy, open-ended problems, we'll, we'll start with defining the criteria to select a solution before we've even defined the problem because it, it, helps, us, it helps us frame it, right? So, so I think, uh, you know, less so about steps, more about capabilities, but, but a couple examples, um, you know, defining good problem statements, right? What is the problem we're trying to solve? What's the gap we're trying to close? To me, that, that's fundamental. Um, it, it belongs, it's not always step one, by the way, but it, it, uh, uh, it, it is foundational to probably any problem solving methodology. Understanding cause and effect, right? Either in current state or in, you know, in, in your solution, but understanding cause and effect is, is sort of foundational to any problem solving capability, at least being curious about it. Um, and, and, and so those are those are examples. Um, there are other capabilities that I think should be be foundational, but aren't always part of the process. So, to me, test to learn, experiment to learn, um, is 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 fundamentally important. It's not always built into problem solving methodology. A lot of people avoid it because it feels you know they'd rather just you know have a facilitated event get to an answer. Um, but I met with a met with a group recently. They were I have we th we think we have these causes. And now we're going to go test each of those causes, right? So we're going to go do some experiments to test which of those causes is most valid. Um, but the idea of experimentation to learn 
I, I think is a capability that belongs as part of any problem solving methodology, less frequently articulated as such, but I think I think should be there. And uh, again, to my earlier point that uh, really good problem solvers, I can see them using all different tools. They'll do that naturally, even if their tool doesn't dictate it as a step. So um, I have another question here. Why did it take you 15 years between books? <laughs> so uh, uh, the, 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 there's, there's probably a, a simple answer, partly of just, you know, I was busy with other stuff. But, you know, the, the real answer was, was, I'd say, twofold. One, for, for quite a few years, I, you know, I kind of looked at, hey, you know, Hitchhiker's Guide. I mean, today it's still required reading at a bunch of companies. And um, so I'm like, hey, you know, what's my message to the world? Like, not should I have another book, but what's my message to the world? And like, my message is still what's in the Hitchhiker's Guide to Lean. So maybe I want to write another book, but I, I, I don't have a new message. This is my message. And I wanted to stay on that. Um, and, and so that was that was probably the main reason I didn't really consider it. The, the second is that I know that writing for me is a... Um, uh, is a process of clarification. It's a process of thinking critically about any topic. And it's not that I wasn't curious, but I wasn't so curious about a singular topic that I wanted to dive into it, right? I, I really never, uh, I never want to write a book that doesn't add to the conversation. I don't want to just write a book that's like, well, here's my take on what other people have said. Even when we wrote The Hitchhiker's Guide to Lean, we, we looked at the topics and like if two other books talk about, you know, clean culture, we're not going to we're not going to include it. And so we, we really looked at what's additive to the conversation. So I I needed to really find where am I going to be added to the conversation and curious enough that I can really dive in deep because uh, I, I also know myself that once I start doing a book, I'm probably going to finish. So I don't want to hate that I picked the wrong topic. Yeah. <laughs> Because I'll get, I'll get, into, I'll end up stuck. I shouldn't be right, but I'll end up stuck with that topic. And I really wanted to to fall in love with the topic to spend that much time with it. So, um, how does one solve a problem that lies outside of their area domain of knowledge expertise? Well, not alone is my first answer. Um, right, I, I'm I'm a big believer. I, I, I like to call problem solving a contact team sport. Right, it has some some uncomfortableness and pain along the way. It doesn't have to be all stressful, but it's just not easy, right? We don't know the answer. But to me, we should never, um, you know, even if it's just a coach, right? We should never be solving problems uh, by ourselves. Um, uh, sometimes I'll just have a, you know, hey, thought partner, right? Sometimes this is what I am for other people. Um, you know, hey, I'm going to think out loud for a little bit. I just need you to tell me I'm, I'm, I'm not crazy as I'm doing that. <laughs> so, so I think the first answer is not alone, right? You, you, you get people involved early, um, get people involved often, um, and, 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 and off you go. Second, I'd say, you know, you need to align around the problem scope, but also the prior priority of the problem, right? So I'll give, a, I'll give a quick example is if, if you have a problem caused by say another department, and uh, for you, it's problem number one, and for them, it's problem number 100. You have to reframe the problem to how does their issue affect me, right? Because I'm not going to get that collaboration because it's just not that important. So I either need to you know, align the prioritization and the scope or change the scope to, 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 to uh, fit the reality of that, um, of that. And then the last I'll say is the right sponsorship, right? Where... Where if where is there uh, you know uh, wh where in the organization can some pe somebody pull people together if we can't do it on our own to make make sure that that happens? Okay, so I do have a couple of hands up. If those people could chat me um, their question, and I can go ahead and answer those live for you if you don't mind. Um, and then a follow-up to the last question also, what if no one in the group has any expertise or knowledge? Well, you know, 
go, you know, sometimes the, the first step is who can we go ask, right? Who, whether it's external or internal, right? I mean, like, like I said, all problem solving is knowledge gaining, right? And so sometimes the first step is let's go ask somebody, uh, let's go buy some research. Um, I don't want to advocate this the wrong way, but go hire a consultant, right? Um, where, where does that knowledge exist? And, um, how can we, how, you know, nobody gets extra points for getting there alone. So, um, you know, what's the easiest way to go gain that knowledge inside or outside? Um, but, but almost by definition, right. We don't have all the knowledge we need. We might, we might just need, uh, uh, we, we, we just might need to pull in knowledge from elsewhere, to even get started. Um, so I'm, I am amazed when people are meeting around problem solving a particular topic that they don't even just ask, well, who should we go ask for some input and perspective on this? Like, it's just a simple question. Uh, who should, who can we go ask for more ideas and more input? Um, but we like, oh, it's, this is the team and off we go. And uh, sometimes that's just a simple step that we, we avoid too often. Okay, so I have a couple more. Um, I know it's time, but I'm just gonna shoot these to you real quick. So emotion or bias as a barrier to problem solving? So I'll answer them fairly quick as well. So uh, emotion drives bias, right? So all bias is, is flawed. The whole point of effective problem solving is that we slow down. I mentioned system one and system two from Daniel Kahneman, slow down our automatic response, pause and think, which automatically helps us manage our bias, right? So emotion mostly drives the bias. And, and so if we slow down, right, so emotion affects it, we want to minimize it, reduce the drama, uh, take some of that out. But fundamentally, when we slow that down, we take out some of the bias, whether it's triggered by emotion or not. Uh, the other side of it, though, there's a part of passion, there's a part of emotion, which is the passion to solve it, which helps people push through the hard parts of problem solving. So we don't want to go through it emotionless. Sometimes it's the emotion of the pain of having the problem that helps us push through the hard work to get to the other side. Okay, um, I have two more. What about the coaches wanting to push the Toyota eight-step model as the only standard? Well, even in Toyota, it's not. So, you know, that's it's the first thing I'd say to that. It's, it's, it's what they teach people to learn problem solving, but that's not the only way problem solving occurs um, and, and never has been. It's certainly not how they got from zero to zero to 50. I think any dogma is, 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 um, well, it's limiting. Let's just call it that. I don't want to say dangerous, but it's limiting. It's limiting. Um, it might be a good way to learn. Um, I think it's a great way to learn. We develop more rigor, we develop more, more nuance and, and, and layers. So I think it's a fantastic way to learn problem solving, but look, you know, <laughs> you know, they don't solve every problem with eight step either. Right, so so it's um, even the most zealotry, a zealot of those out there. You go observe them; they're not. It's not the only way they're going to solve problems. It might be the only tool they use, but it's not the only way they solve problems. Okay, and last one. So, what advice could you give an aspiring author? Um, start. It don't it doesn't have to be a book, right? I I wrote it even between the two books. I wrote a column for industry week and for that assembly magazine write a blog right so just start um start in small nuggets pick things that are interesting to you and just just start and it uh, you know you don't even need to put it on linkedin that's it doesn't have to be you know, anyone can publish an article on linkedin so just start um find your passion and and build up some momentum Thank you so much, Jamie. Um, thank you to everybody who sent in their questions as well. A quick reminder, um, you will receive an email from me within 24 to 48 hours with a link to view the recording. Again, Jamie, thank you so much for your time and for participating in today's webinar. We will see you all again soon. Bye-bye.